<laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming today. We have an exciting session planned. Um, as President Faust mentioned, um, his method teaching was pioneered here at Harvard, and it has long been practiced in disciplines here from the law school to the business school to the medical school. Um, but in recent years, we're seeing a growing trend where faculty from across an even broader array of disciplines are interested in experimenting with case method as one method for promoting interactivity in their classrooms and fostering deep learning. So today's session is going to explore how case teaching is being both adapted, adopted and adapted across schools and disciplines at Harvard. We're going to engage in conversation with faculty from the Kennedy School, the Graduate School of Education, and the Business School. And we're going to explore a little bit about how case teaching might differ in each of these different settings. But first, we'd like to engage you in an interactive ex exercise designed to put you in the shoes of learners. We've asked Archon Fung, who's the Academic Dean and Ford Foundation Professor of Democracy and Citizenship at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, to lead us through a very short case learning exercise. I want to emphasize that this is a very compressed exercise because we don't have a lot of time, but I think it will give you a taste of what it feels like to be a learner in a case-based classroom. Afterwards, we're going to pull back the curtain and we're going to debrief a little bit with Archon about his approach to teaching and learning through the case method. Great. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Thanks, everyone, for uh, coming to this uh, part of the, the workshop. Um, when I looked at the participant list, I was uh, more than a little bit intimidated. There are many uh, better case teachers up here than I am, to be sure. But I think you probably learn more from a mediocre teacher from, than from a really good one in the, um, when you take it apart. So I'm happy to be of service to you today. <laughs> Ah, I look forward to that. <laughs> so each of you should have uh, in front of you a short case called Voting Right, a Trump Loyalist Discovers a Clandestine Project that was uh, prepared a few, few short weeks ago. And if you could spend the next three or four minutes reading that case with an eye toward deciding whether the protagonist, Ron, should leak or not leak. All right, so everyone should make up your mind about whether or not you think that Ron Wood should leak this, uh, what he's discovered about the Trump campaign to uh, his sister, who's a political reporter at the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Uh, no abstentions allowed. So everybody who thinks... <laughs> Mr. Wood should leak. Please raise your hand and keep them up while we count. Did you get a count? 25. And if you think that Mr. Wood should not leak, please raise your hand. Fourteen. Okay. Let's go first to the people who think that Mr. Wood should leak. Who? Uh, somebody want to? You guys don't have name cards. I can't easily cold call. <laughs> which, which which need a little bit of a disadvantage, but I'll count on your participatory energy. Uh, who's somebody? Uh, somebody who thought that Mr. Wood should leak? Why? Offer a reason. Yeah. Um, he was clearly, I mean, he was certainly clearly disturbed by the, his discovery, and so, I mean, he has to follow his moral compass to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. so, moral, so his own kind of personal moral compass? Uh, moral compass. He thought it was wrong. Anybody else? Yeah. I feel that also it's getting in the way of the democratic process because one possible impact is that some people might not be able to vote. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're thinking maybe the in terms of the stakes, you think the stakes are pretty high. Some people will be disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. Yes. So 
his own personal interest because his sister could get ahead in her career. <laughs> is that a reason to, to do it or not to do it? That's a reason to do it. Sister could get ahead. You get ahead? Some people might think that's a reason not to do it as well. <laughs> yes? It's a, um, it's a violation of the espoused principle of the Trump campaign. So if, um, and maybe this is because my, because Larry Colbert was my dissertation advisor, but um, if, if that, you know, that's a higher principle than his personal affiliation to his parents, and even his sister in this particular case, um, but it's violating the principle of democracy. Mm -hmm. so saying one thing and doing something else structure violates democracy as a superior principle again about the great stakes yes let's do one more to kind of build on that these are existing laws on the books that that the campaign is saying they're going to try to enforce but the fact that okay. they are focusing on particular swing states that are critical to Trump being elected mm -hmm. Like there is an ulterior motive here. They're not just trying to enforce the law. Uh huh. And so uh, part of it is maybe the hypocrisy or mixed motives. Anybody else? Let's move to the other side. Let's look at uh, the some of the 14 folks who thought that Mr. Wood should not leak. Why not? Yeah. I was thinking if it had been that we found that the Clinton campaign was working on voter mobilization efforts clandestinely, but to the very limit of registration law, mm -hmm. that would seem totally like professional politics to me. So the fact that this wasn't doing anything but enforcing existing laws, working to enforce existing laws to the limits, seem like it doesn't violate his employer agreement with the campaign. If he quits, which he sure might want to do, um, since he has reached a moral norm for himself, then he could presumably do whatever he wants with at least verbal versions of the information. Okay, so a couple of reasons here that you offered. One is that he's not doing anything there that not he, the campaign is not doing anything illegal and indeed may be playing the game that it's supposed to play by winning the elections within the boundaries of the law. They didn't make up the rules of the game. They're playing according to them. So what's wrong with that? Right? That's number one. And number two, in response to the moral compass kind of thing, you're saying, well, you know, Ron was probably entrusted with all kinds of confidential information as part of the job of working on this campaign. Here's another piece of it. Um, and so part of his responsibility and his job is actually not to leak. He's given all kinds of valuable information. Yeah. So he, has a, he apparently has a moral comment. Um, how he works that out is up to him. And so he... Is it? Is uh, it? Well, he can choose because he could also talk within the Trump campaign. He could also check all sorts of things that he could do. Okay, sort of very secretly trying to undermine his employer. Very good. So alternative actions, right? The case is completely silent on whether he considered or pursued alternative actions. Uh, maybe he could have uh, gone to superiors. To say, hey, I think there's something going on here. Uh, it's kind of kind of fishy. If it came out in the Cleveland Plain Deal or other paper or papers, it might not look so good. Maybe you guys ought to reconsider this. All right? Alternatives. Yeah. So this is revealing my political loyalties. <laughs> this is July 2016. I said you shouldn't leave. This is July 2016. Is this the first time this guy has some? More issues. <laughs> 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 the issue is something that's legal but being selectively enforced in the swing states. I feel like this guy is, you know, living on another planet. So you subscribe to certain things, and this seems the least egregious of things there. <laughs> 
or you should have you know, taken action much before this. Mm, right, right, least egregious. It's inconsistent to me that suddenly in July you're troubled by this. I mean, okay. Fair, no, that's fair enough. He signed on to, he presumably knew the candidate and what the candidate stood for. He signed on to something that's not completely uh, clean at the outset, probably in either campaign. So yeah. Suddenly, this doesn't strike me as the uh, most contentious issue mm -hmm. that we would have encountered or seen in July. <laughs> fair play. Right. Good. So uh, this is excellent. One, so uh, obviously what I've done here is uh, kind of sketch up reasons to leak and not to leak. And basically the order of categories of reasons, put those reasons into categories. One category that people didn't raise yet is whether leaking would accomplish anything. And that is a point about <coughs> efficacy. Do you think it would, did anybody think that whether you should leak or not depended on whether it would have an effect, yes or no? And do you think it would have an effect? What? Not so far. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think it would, but I, well, I was in the no, no leak thing just because she's leaking to his sister. Oh, so. In other words, his motives can be uh, questioned and so can his sister's. Mm -hmm. and in other words, and to, and to the gentleman's last point, just mark out the name Trump. Sure. In other words, do the you know, John Walls thing. In other words, this is, this is a situation mm -hmm. characterized by these things. I think putting the Trump label in there you know, galvanizes our, our emotions. It takes us away. In other words, we should be able to argue independently of who the subject is. OK, very good. Therefore, if he's going to leak to the sister, it shouldn't solely be to her. Because if there's, it's not an arm's length transaction. Right. So one of the alternatives here might be that he uh, leaked to somebody who doesn't have a personal relationship with the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, whatever it is. And that would have, you maybe would have moved over to the leak side if it had been some option like that. Yes. yes. OK, good. Um, all right. So uh, now I'm going to hand out another case. Where is it? Er, uh, Carolyn and um, which you have to decide now whether or not this case does the Rawls thing or not. This one, also fictional, is a little bit closer to reality. OK, so take another few seconds to make up your mind about whether Kelly Egan should go to WikiLeaks or not. Everybody who thinks that Kelly Egan should go, raise your hand. Quiet so we know. Fess up. What is, what's the count there? 16. 16. Everybody who thinks that uh, Kelly Egan should not leak. I mean, we could do the math here, but it's probably better to get a real count. <laughs> yeah. What do we got? 24, 23. Ah, everybody did vote. Excellent. <laughs> Good. So uh, similar drill. Obviously, some people think that, well, maybe you, do, maybe you didn't think about it that hard, but it, you might infer that there's some asymmetry between the cases. So uh, is there something different about the two jobs that the people have, Kelly Egan and R R different commitments that they made to their employer somehow, which way does that weigh? Is that the reason anybody decided that um, Egan should not leak? Is the job pretty much the same? I mean, they're both handling lots of confidential information. They What's different about their jobs? Anything? Yeah. I, when I say that their jobs are uh, somewhat different, um, only because in the context of the second um, story, the case, we get the idea that that person had been put on the spot to defend the position uh -huh. in public before. And so I thought because of that person's reputation, that's a different situation. And I still would lead to. Uh-huh. 
Right. So maybe uh, there if you had had made not quite promises, but public representations to the contrary. Um, but that's that's puzzling, right? Because if that's the case, then we should see more numbers over here. But that's not exactly what we see. Um, yes. Well, and also, I mean, she's not working for a particular candidate, or that this DNC isn't supposed to be working for a particular candidate. Right. It does make a difference. It makes a difference, right? And so, how did that weigh in your mind about whether uh, she should leak or not leak? That it's the DNC. I, I voted because I wanted to be consistent, so I voted. <laughs> like, fair, it's okay for one. And fair it's enough. Okay for the other. Yeah, yeah, fair That's enough. How I voted so wait, which way did you go? Uh, to, to leak. To leak, right? And so if you think that, I think that reason also favors leaking more because Ron Wood made a commitment to a particular campaign to sign on board and fight as hard as he could for that campaign. I, I mean, Kelly if Egan's. If that were to make a difference, I should have said. Ron Wood should not leak, and she should. Correct. Um, right. But I did it because. Right. It but was again, a I'm puzzled. In the <laughs> aggregate, it goes the other way, right? Uh, so again, the person, the role, the job is uh, to run a primary in a fair way, or part of it, right? Okay. So let's go a little bit to the stakes. Can I say something about the role? Yeah. I think beyond, your role when you take a job goes beyond a particular job. You, oh, yes. have a, uh, you have a responsibility to a greater audience besides just the job. Mm -hmm. you, yeah, you that way. So you, your job may be the to work in the primary campaign. Yes. You may see your job as serving the greater public. So, uh, so it could go a couple, you could see it as serving the greater public and that might weigh in favor of leaking. Or you could see it as serving the Democrats and making sure they win in the general, right? Um, which might favor in uh, not leaking. Let's go a little bit to the stakes question. Are the stakes greater or less great than in the Trump leak case? Oftentimes, we think that the uh, main reason that justifies leaking or not leaking to the public, breaking your promise that you've made to an organization to keep these secrets, is that there's some great injustice at stake. And people talked about that in the Trump case. The great injustice here would be that it violates a democratic principle or that a bunch of people are disenfranchised, right? So Snowden, one of probably the most famous leaker of recent years, thought that there was a great injustice in uh, hundred, hundreds of millions of people being surveilled without their consent. Are the stakes here bigger, smaller? How did you think about the stakes? And do they weigh in favor of leaking or not leaking? Are there significant stakes? Jack? A party is not a country. And parties make their own rules for how they run their processes. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, the the stakes for the democratic principle are something smaller. So parties control primaries, and so it's not the whole shebang. So maybe the stakes are reduced compared to the general that's being manipulated here. Yeah. WikiLeaks is not the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Right, right. Um, so there's a there's a different set of stakes about what we mean by the freedom of the press and freedom of information that would have to be thought through. Right. And so uh, which way does that cut? Do you think that WikiLeaks is more dangerous or more open? I mean, there's the sister point that weighs in favor of going against the Cleveland Plain Dealer, but there might be a Julian Assange is a nut job that weighs in yeah, favor no, of I going was, against I, WikiLeaks. I was one of the switchers who voted to not leak the first time and to leak the second time, or no, yes, to not leak the first time and to not leak the second time. Okay. Um, so I'm not a switcher. Um, and it's because I think uh, one could have a reasonable disagreement about the ethicalness of WikiLeaks, and I don't want to encourage it as a way of adjudicating things and publicizing things in our democracy. Okay, good, good. And so that weighs in favor of not leaking because you think there's something suspect about the outlet. Yeah. Uh, maybe she should talk to his sister. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. They should call each other. Uh, anybody think that the stakes were great enough to justify going public here? Yes? I think that 
it's about transparency and the democracy, and so uh, in both cases, um, it you know it may be legal or it may be illegal, but people should know what's going on. People should, and something's going on that they don't know about, and maybe if they did know about it, they wouldn't like it very much. At least yeah. some people. Or they're both. Very good. Others? Yes. In the second case, it's a short-term impact. In the previous case, it's a long-term impact. A short-term impact in what? So how are you differentiating? Yeah, it's this primary. Mm -hmm. Gives two candidates versus the process underlying for the long run in the first case. Okay, good. Short-term. You think the time horizon is shorter here. It's about the primary. That weighs in favor of maybe not leaking because. No, leaking either way. But the stakes are higher in the first case. Stakes are higher in the first case. The right. process right. is broader. Right. OK, good. Other considerations here about the stakes? Yeah, so in my case, I, I have found the two cases kind of similar. And I didn't vote consistently because if you had asked us to <laughs> vote again on the first case, I would have changed my Oh, case. I see. Oh, very good. Very so good. the reason is that um, leak and don't leak seem to me more of a last resort type of decision. Yes. And I think I would have, now, if you ask me you know, the same question about the, if each case, my first uh, probably impulse would be to try to resolve the, the problem internally. Yes. And then leak or not leak as a, a that would be a second step. You know, if, if it's not if we're not able to come clean internally, then yeah, then maybe it's a it's a higher stake uh, action. Great. And so, what might it have looked like to resolve it internally in the second case? Can you imagine? Yeah, I think I would have tried to encourage the DNC to come clean and say, yeah, that's true. We. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we favored uh, Hillary over Bernie. We apologized. Uh, you know, sort of kind of uh, acknowledge what, what happened. Yeah, all right. Without having to go through. To all the way to WikiLeaks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. Another alternative might be negotiate with the Sanders people to yeah. say, hey, Figure look, we, maybe we didn't treat you that fairly, but mm -hmm. we can make it right. Try to, right? So those are some of the, yeah. Me another variable here that, that I found different, and it was hard. To, it was a tougher call for me in the DNC case because there was reference there to there had been repeated requests from the Sanders campaign. So the organization had been repeatedly called on what's your integrity? Mm -hmm. what, are you, what are your rules of the road? I didn't get that same sense of the organization having been multiply questioned at, in the first case. Right, so there's maybe a consist somebody else is calling them to account. What I find myself reacting to as a protagonist is what is my responsibility to my organization in terms of loyalty to my organization, to my superiors, etc. And when is it okay to deviate from that? Yes. I feel like it's more okay to deviate from that if I have repeatedly seen evidence of what I judge to be, you know, inappropriateness, as opposed to well, I just don't like what you're doing. And I have a sister that can do something about that because it seems to me that abrogates the the responsibility you have to voice dissent yes. or discontent within your organizational responsibility. Yes. Good. Very good. And then last, uh, I got to wrap it up so we can get to the panel. But last consideration: Did do people think that it would have made a difference in this case? The efficacy, the kind of consequential point. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is kind of where my my decision lies because what is the problem we're trying to solve? We're trying are we trying to are we trying to resolve or reconcile the fact that a Democratic National Committee didn't want to um, throw their support behind someone who wasn't previously uh, aligned with that party? That may not actually be surprising if you think about it analytically. So if you really take the long view of the problem we're trying to solve, maybe the problem we're trying to to wrestle with here is how the two party system works. Um, and we, you know, doing something that's potentially morally, you know, uh, not positive to leak things that are aren't yours to leak necessarily isn't going to solve a problem that big. Mm -hmm. so if we're going to really wrestle so, with that as the it, problem. This isn't going to be the the stage where it gets resolved. Mm -hmm. Very good. Good. So the oh yeah okay good. Can I have a logical question now that we can come maybe the panel can come back. To yes you. yeah so we'll debrief on that. Choices. And I can see arguments for that because it highlights some of the principles, you know, the deep principles and sort of surfaces those. Um, 
And then you allowed for mediating kinds of responses. You know, don't do either really, but do this instead and then that next. And that kind Correct. of pushes to the complexity of the case in some ways. Yes. And I just, I just Difficult to deal with in 20 minutes. Yeah. To talk about that pedagogical choice. Yes. Dichotomize yes. As you have. Yeah. So right let's, let's do that in, in just a couple of minutes. I just want to wrap by responding, you know, kind of the, the take home point. This, that's the point of doing these two cases is because the general presumption in any of our jobs is that we are loyal to the organization. And in public life especially, but in private sector life also, we can be called upon or situations can reveal themselves that are, uh, that go the other way, that for some reason lead us because of our moral compass, our judgments about the public good, to disobey the presumptive commitment to be loyal to the organization. And what uh, this case is about is, or this, ser this pairing of cases is about, is trying to articulate it, some general principles that ought to guide us in that very difficult choice, right? I feel like it is almost never good enough reason to disobey. It's got to be deeper than that. Maybe you feel like it compromises your personal integrity. If that's the case, maybe you should resign rather than go public. Almost always, right, uh, people in, who think about when it's OK to disobey say that it's, you've got to have, there have to be pretty big stakes on the table. Martin Luther King broke the law to fight racial discrimination and, and de jure segregation, a great evil, right? Uh, people also think that there ought to be a judgment that disobeying will work, will move the ball forward in some way, because you know that disobeying will upset the system in all kinds of ways. What's on the other side of that ledger? And then finally, people think that you ought to have exhausted other alternatives before you go to WikiLeaks or go public or really you know, take a dramatic form of disobedience. And so those are the kind of that, the point of uh, the lessons learned in this exercise is aimed to articulate the principles that govern whether or not it's OK to disobey or not. And just um, finally, last question. How many people after the discussion would have changed their vote on the Trump scenario? So about, what, six? Yeah, maybe six changes. OK, great. Thank you very much. So we're going to pull back the curtain a moment and debrief with Archon on kind of how that teaching experience went. First of all, Archon, why did you choose to teach this session or this learning goal with a case versus a lecture or some other type of, of teaching approach? Uh, I think uh, two reasons. I think primarily the first reason is engagement. I think that uh, situating people in a relevant situation is a much better way of engaging the learner than me giving a lecture about the ethics of civil disobedience, um, which would be the al one alternative form, often how this material is delivered. Right? Um, so uh, I think that's the main reason. And the second reason is that uh, one of the things that we try to do in a professional environment is not just teach the theory and the framework, but put people in a position in which they're compelled to use that theory and framework in a very decision forcing kind of way. So we just handed around um, copies of the teaching plan. Could you tell us a little bit about your process for preparing to teach this session today? Yeah. So I was, I was talking to a friend of mine at the business school, and, and he told me that for every session, uh, every contact hour, he spends about 10 other hours preparing. I did not do that uh, in, in this instance, uh, and I rarely do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's very admirable. But so I had a kind of more compressed process that's, that's twofold. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But these cases were actually kind of custom prepared a few weeks ago, not for uh, this session, but for one like it, in which we um, uh, talked to a new faculty at the Kennedy School about how to do 
case teaching. So that was the kind of first step, is thinking about what cases would be uh, workable in a compressed time format that would be salient to people from different disciplines and different approaches, and in which I could teach, <laughs> do a reasonably good job of teaching. And then, you know, once the cases were prepared, and we did that in a fairly rapid way, you know, what I, I have, you know, even in the designing of the cases, know generally what I want to pull out of it. And then in terms of case prep, um, I make sure that I have more than one shot at the prep. So uh, de uh, definitely a few days before the session, I'll make one outline and envision kind of going there uh, and what it'll look like. And then maybe a day before the session, I will revisit and elaborate and course adjust. Because I, I find it takes me a couple of drafts to kind of imagine the teaching plan going the way I, I want it to. And then I, you know, I try to follow the advice of Clay Christensen and many other people in trying to figure out what the big blocks of time are going to be and then what the board plan is going to be. So you know, obviously, I, I had the board plan in my mind um, well beforehand. So presumably, your learning goal for today was not for us to um, spend time thinking about you know, necessarily whistleblowing, which is probably, hopefully not a situation we will find ourselves in in the near future. Tell surprised. us a little bit about kind of what your kind of overall, more generalizable learning goal was and how you think the session went in terms of advancing that goal. Um, so the uh, thing is J.J. Abrams, when people write about his movies, there's always some black box or surprise, some gimmick or mechanism that makes the whole thing work. In uh, this pair of cases, obviously, the black box here is the asymmetry or symmetry between the Trump and Clinton cases. And what that's meant to highlight is um, how flawed your intuition can be. Right. So there is the philosophical kind of uh, imperative to treat like cases alike. But oftentimes, our intuition doesn't go that way. And it didn't go that way, obviously. So this would have worked much less well if there hadn't been this, this um, difference in uh, an asymmetry in how people felt about the Clinton and Trump cases. right? I was pretty sure there would be, because we're at Harvard University. But you never know. right? And so it's important to expose the error of your intuitions, because that gets the whole ball rolling in a professional ethics kind of context, right? The resistance to, to the, the learner in a professional ethics discussion is there's nothing to talk about. I know what right and wrong is, and my heart tells me what to do. Why am I sitting in your class for a semester, right? So the most important thing is to say, no, you have no idea what right and wrong is. You need a more rigorous way of thinking about that. And the most easy way to demonstrate that is to get them to put material on the table that exposes their own inconsistency of thinking, which I hope I successfully did with you. So I'm going to go a little bit um, off script here. But I think it might be helpful for this group to get a sense of how, uh, what you teach at the Kennedy School and kind of how um, case method has kind of crept into the way you think about teaching. Yeah. So. Uh... I teach professional ethics is one thing I teach. I also teach in the joint degree program with the law students and public policy students, people getting both degrees. And then uh, off and on, I teach a class on social innovation and social change. And the case method comes in uh, quite differently in those three contexts, right? And so in the professional ethics, it oftentimes looks like this, something like this. In the uh, law school class, uh, it, it looks quite different. Uh, yesterday, we just did a case on Prop 8 and L in California about gay marriage and LGBT strategy with regard to how to deal with that. So that's obviously much less ethical. It's not even the innovation there is it's all law school students, but it's not legal case analysis. It's not a legal opinion. It's a situation on the ground in which both legal skills and policy and political skills are required to move the ball forward. And so the aim of case teaching there is to get students to think about and apply the different skill sets that they've learned at the Kennedy School and the, um, and the law school to solving 
a problem that requires both kinds of perspectives and lenses. Great. I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to introduce the rest of our panel. Um, you're the academic dean of the Kennedy School. Um, is the demonstration that we've just experienced typical of case teaching at the Kennedy School? Uh, I think the t case teaching at the t Kennedy School is a high-variance enterprise. Um, <laughs> Uh, but that's a good thing because that creates the possibility of improvement all across the organization. Um, <laughs> and, and so I think we have a, a number of uh, very experienced case teachers who have paid very close attention to what happens at the business school who are very, very expert at it. And then we have a number of new learners uh, or new teachers who are uh, learning about how to teach through cases. And you know, kind of preparing for this session and, and reading the, the Gavin piece again really made me 